That's the pulse toy. Hello. Hello. Later. Um, hello, hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon to those in the Americas. Uh, good evening to colleagues in Europe, and maybe good morning to our Asian colleagues. Uh, my name is Dennis Baldocki, and I'm very pleased to introduce today's um, Ameriflux uh, webinar speaker, uh, Dr. John Zobitz. Uh, John's really a, a great person to give this lecture. Uh, he was trained as a flux person uh, with Dave Bowling at the University of Utah, so he knows our lingo but he's also a math professor. So he really knows how to teach really important concepts of time series analysis, uh, how to deal with complex data uh, that is actually accessible to I think us as the community. Um, we're working with such complicated multivariate non-parametric data. In fact, I learned from Paul Stoy the power of uh, kernel density functions <laughs> and so, uh, I think it's really nice that we have John here to kind of give us a, a primer on how to look at our data differently and how to apply uh, better ways of, of math. Uh, so John, uh, welcome to uh, Mariflux and we'll look forward to hearing what you have to tell us. All right, Th thank you so much for the introduction, Dennis. I'm, I'm really happy to be here today and just kind of overwhelmed with all these participants, right? This is, this is amazing. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen for today's talk, um, let me do this because once I start sharing my screen, right, I kind of lose all the other functionality of teaching, right? Teaching in the time of Zoom. Um, let me kind of minimize this. Oh, well, I won't worry about it. Um, so, so here we are, right? I'm very excited to be talk, talk, talk about this today. Um, one of the things that I, I think is really nice is that this is a very timely topic, right? So here, here's a recent Twitter conversation that um, happened last week between Amy Trowbridge, um, Ji Yang, and um, Paul Stoy, right? And they're talking about causality, right? And thankfully, um, you know, thanks to Dennis for plugging this upcoming seminar about how to do it, right? So we'll delve into the details about this today. Um, what I aim to do in the next hour is I really want to talk about how to explain and apply techniques that quantify causality separate from association. Um, here's kind of a paper that was published in Nature Methods talking about association, correlation, and causation. And these are tricky subjects. I mean, we, you know, teaching introductory statistics, we talk about association, correlation, right? And I mean, they trip people up, um, you know, even, even myself, right? And so, you know, I tend to think about association, right? Is there some sort of non-constant um, relationship between the variable, functional relationship? Correlation maybe just talks about linear correlation between them. But, you know, with, with sort of like, you know, we, we do this in introductory statistics, talk about Anscombe's quartet, right? They're like four different types of data sets, visually different, right? But they give the same correlation coefficient. So, you know, that, that's a tricky thing to disentangle, especially when you have lots of data, lots of variables you're measuring, and you're trying to disentangle processes from that. So, so my goal today is talk about a brief overview and give you some tools that could get you quickly started using these techniques. Um, so for today's outline, I'll talk a little bit about me, right? There's a lot of familiar faces that I see, but there's a lot of new ones too. So I kind of want to introduce myself a little bit talk about methods, determine causality, um, apply it to the FlexNet 2015 data set, some next steps, kind of bring in some conversation and, and, and wrap up. So hopefully this will be an informative hour um, today. So a little bit about me, right? And the, the kind of the subtitle is, it's really to kind of express gratitude and appreciation for your efforts. So I, I graduated in 2007 with my PhD from the University of Utah, co-advised by Dr. Dave Bowling and Dr. Fred Adler. My, my thesis topic was isotopic flux partitioning um, in Niwot Ridge, Colorado. Since that time, um, I've been at Augsburg University in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm a professor of mathematics and data science. You know, if you kind of were to pull me today, what are my current research interests? I think a lot of about environmental data science, process-based modeling. Some of the recent projects that I've worked on kind of in the right-hand side here is looking at sort of taking modus data, modus kernels, and then um, trying to develop a smoother to, you know, instead of on an eight-day timescale, translate to a daily timescale. 
Um, this past spring, I was fortunate enough to be a Fulbright Scholar and I traveled to Finland um, and I worked with colleagues at the University of Eastern Finland examining data across a fire chrono sequence in Canada to um, partition soil fluxes. So, I mean, a lot of it, it sits at the intersection of mathematics, data, uh, modeling, and environmental science. Um, mo most importantly, too, is to kind of think about sort of the context of where I work, right, and Augsburg University, in case you haven't heard of it. Um, we're a private liberal arts undergraduate university. Um, I I've worked there for 14 years. I teach a range of mathematics courses across all levels of the curriculum, from developmental mathematics, like um, algebra, to um, upper level courses in modeling, differential equations, data science. Um, so I think a lot about ways that I can infuse my own sort of scholarship into the curriculum. Um, and kind of what is really important about Augsburg and sort of its context is that we're located in one of the most diverse zip codes in Minnesota. Um, most importantly too, is that we are about four and a half kilometers from where George Floyd was murdered. And I mean, it's been a very challenging year for all of us in many ways. Um, but, you know, I was teaching online during the pandemic when the riots in Minneapolis were going on. And that, you know, really causes, caused me to sort of think back and reflect about sort of how my teaching, how my pedagogy, how my scholarship intersects with issues of justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, and how to advance that um, forward, right? And, you know, part of it's for the students. Here, here's a picture of our incoming class. They were freshmen in fall of 2019 during the before times. And it's a broad mix of students. And I've been sort of fortunate enough over these past 14 years to kind of see that change in our student body, right? So we, the majority of our students are students of color, the first generation. And I mean, they're, they're dreamers in the broadest sense of the word, right? They have high hopes, high aspirations. And I feel very privileged to kind of be there and kind of sit at that intersection with their hopes and dreams to kind of advance them forward. Why, why this is important and how it kind of connects to Ameriflux and FluxNet data is that your data have an impact. Um, you know, there's, you know, unquestionable, there's definite scientific merit to the data that you're collecting and sharing, but there's also a human impact. And I kind of want to give three quick examples of that because I think sometimes those don't get, you know, um, accentuated a lot. So he, here's one, this, um, one of my students, Mohammed. Um, he was a major in economics and mathematics and was interested in kind of doing some mathematical research. So we took a look at some flux data um, and then we applied concepts from economics, um, the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of inequality, to look at, you know, across a growing season, how does that distribution of an environmental measurement or a flux kind of, is it, is it equally distributed and unequally distributed? What would that mean? Right, we published a paper. Um, you know, he he now has a career working for a leading healthcare company um, doing healthcare analytics, okay? So he was able to sort of take what he had learned using that flux data and translate that into a meaningful career. Also a Madeline um, who kind of continued Muhammad's work. I want, we wanted to broaden it out to more sites. Um, what became really interested in looking at flux sites in South America, mainly because she was a mathematics and Spanish double major, was traveling on a study abroad to um, South America and wanted to just kind of see what what are these fluxes, you know, just kind of like very curious questions about what's what's the landscape like, you know, what what should we expect? Tried to visit a flux site, um, didn't necessarily work out, but you know that that's all fine. But she's able to leverage that experience to live and work abroad internationally. Um, and kind of the third example. I like to think of myself as a problem child, right? And, and this sort of solidified, right? Um, so I published a paper kind of several years ago on forest carbon uptake and the fundamental theorem of calculus. If you look at a time series of NEE, it's a rate of change, right? And we can apply calculus tools to it. So after this paper was published, um, I got contacted by these authors of this calculus textbook to say, hey, would you want to develop sort of that paper into a homework problem? I'm like, sure, right? So we kind of worked in collaboration and your, your flux data, this is from Niowa Ridge in Colorado, is a homework problem um, that calculus students take. So, so in many ways, right, the, the data that you collect has, you know, it has an impact for students in both small and big ways. And, you know, it's sort of sustained me professionally. 
um, it, you know, during my career. So I, I just kind of want to say thank you. And I appreciate, you know, express gratitude to all of you that provide, collect, and sort of, you know, distribute these data out to the public, because I sort of stand on your shoulders for that. Um, let, let's talk about kind of just, you know, not, not enough about me, right? Talk about methods to determine causality. I'm going to focus this seminar on sort of three topics, Granger causality, transfer entropy, convergent cross map. There, there, are, there are others, but um, I, I think it's, you know, this was what I thought was sort of useful to focus on just to kind of narrow the focus. Um, I, I, I want to acknowledge um, that I'm sort of standing on the shoulders. And what I mean by that is when I started to sort of prepare the seminar and kind of look through the literature, there was a really great review article published in Water Resources Research um, by Dr. Mohamed Ombadi, um, civil environmental engineer, just finished a PhD doing a postdoc at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, um, looking at evaluation of methods for causal discovery in hydrometeorological systems. Great paper, right? Very informative, um, taking sort of, you know, a hydrology context to it. And what I, you know, once I saw this paper, you know, I kind of gravitated to it and said, okay, I want to try to like replicate this as much as I can in the time that I have and apply it to these flux data. So highly recommend this article, um, you know, if you kind of want to dig in a little bit more about it. And I, I do want to express my gratitude to Dr. Ombadi for kind of, you know, communication with them, setting this up, um, you know, for kind of just some consultation and advice of how to move forward. So, you know, one thing that I want to talk about too is like, why, why is this a hard problem, right? And, and I think that that's a good question to ask. And, and so, you know, there, there's kind of like four basic ways that two variables X and Y could be related. You could say X causes Y or Y causes X, you know, kind of that reverse causality. They could be bi-directional causality, right? So I kind of think of like in terms of a positive feedback loop, one goes up, the other one goes up, you know, so they're sort of working in synergy with each other or there's no causality. So for like a given set of two variables, these are the four different options. Now, when we think about, um, you know, what if we have not just two, but three or four, like how many different independent causal structures could you have? This problem grows very quickly, um, you know, in terms of the number of structures. Two, there's four, you know, four things to test, three, six, four, okay, that's fine. But then you get up to like four or five, right? It, it just, you know, it's a very hard problem to test all of these different structures independently and, you know, to test for significance and to make it meaningful. So, you know, the, the focus, I think, and that I think that's rightly so, is to like, let's develop methods that are computationally fast, right? They give us information very quickly. So that way we can ascertain, is there a causal relationship between these variables? And I mean, that, that's what I think is kind of fascinating is, you know, if you kind of look at the history of these methods, there is a lot of contributions by computer scientists, computational um, philosophers, right, to sort of sort this out, because it, this, this is a hard problem just mathematically and computationally to sort through, much less like thinking about sort of the biological implications of variables being causally related to. So what I'm gonna do, I'll talk about these three methods and then I'm just gonna apply them to a small data set, right? And we're gonna look at sort of a sample time series of daily air temperature and NEE from Niwot Ridge in Colorado, right? Um, now flux data, they're provided half hourly, but just for the ease of computation, I aggregated them up to a day, right? And you have this time series. Now, one, one thing which was kind of like a mind shift for me was to you know, think about these as time series and not necessarily functional relationships between variables, right? I, you know, I think we're, we're very used to looking at plots, you know, just represent like air temperature versus NEE to kind of look, is there an exponential relationship or other sorts of functional relationships? And, you know, there's, you know, just even just plotting all these data together, you see differences between night and day or um, actually these are daily values. So summertime, um, wintertime, right? And, you know, yes, those functional relationships exist. They're well-documented, but that's process-based modeling. This is more looking at empirical dynamical modeling. And the, the central unit that you focus on is with time series. So, so with that, let, let's talk about Granger causality, right? So the 
person who sort of developed this is Sir Clive Granger, an economist. And kind of the basic question is that does variable X cause variable Y? Okay, so, so that, that's sort of how it's phrased in kind of a classical statistics mindset. So here's how this works. You take two time series, X and Y, you do a regression of Y against leg values of Y. So, you know, maybe it's just a day time, like two day time, like and you kind of like, you know, do these legged regressions, linear regressions together. Uh, and maybe it's a certain point for, for my purposes. I just looked at the past two weeks, right? You could extend that further. All right, so once you have that regression of Y against its leg values, you do a second regression of Y against leg values of Y, but then you also include the leg values of X. And again, linear association, and you have two different linear regressions. And, and here's where maybe the, cl the comfortable classical statistics come in, is that you apply an F test to see if including leg values of X increases the explanatory power. And, and that, that's greater causality in a nutshell. What I like about it is, you know, it's it's sort of like explained in terms that that I think, you know, if you've had a course in linear regression or experience or exposure to it, it it's like, oh yeah, I, I can kind of see that, right? Um, and it's very easy to code up and implement. In you know, I use R, right? You can use any sort of statistical software program. Um, and here's kind of some example of, you know, my workflow, right? I use, I'll, I'll talk about this later, but I use sort of the tidyverse, um, our scripts and, and just kind of like try to develop digestible code, but you just sort of like pull out a data set, identify the significance level that you want, the leg, apply the test and you get sort of output that says, here's the value, the F value, the critical value, the distribution. Do you reject the null hypothesis that there's no causality? Okay, so that that's great. I mean, what you know, um, that once I was able to code that up, it, it was very slick. Here's kind of the the downfall, and and this is where these other methods kind of respond to it. This assumes that your time series are linearly related, linear causality, which you know that may not be the case, right? And you know, and and I think starting with Granger causality is important because. You know, that's always a good first step in applying sort of the new techniques, new methods. Are these linearly associated or, you know, related to one another? But, you know, we should consider nonlinear processes, right? Nonlinear causality, because I think that might explain some of the more nuance and structure within the data. So kind of as a response to that, is um, that, you know, I, I, I don't know kind of when these were developed. I think transfer entry became later. Um, was transfer entropy. And, you know, just kind of looking through the, the literature and, you know, where did it originate from? I, I kind of settled on um, Dr. James Massey. Information theorist kind of gives you a little hint about what, what's to come, cryptographer. Starts with the same question. Does variable X cause variable Y? Um, so, so here's how this works. It takes concepts from information theory, right? It starts with the two time series. What it does, and, and this is that information theoretic approach, it measures the callback, callback, so Leibler um, divergence, considering each time series and the leg. So it, it sort of compares, you know, the distribution of measurements, of including Y or including Y and X by itself. And it, it's just a measure of, you know, you want sort of a non-zero divergence to say, yes, there is information in there um, in this time series, when you include x versus y by itself. Um, the tricky part here is how do you estimate significance, kind of pulling in these sort of classical statistics tests. So kind of one technique that I saw, it uses bootstraps, bootstrapping. So just to kind of give you a quick reminder of what bootstrapping is, let's say you have sort of a vector. It doesn't necessarily need to be a time series. And you know, there's a certain order to it. You kind of run a statistical test, a bootstrap, then just kind of resample with replacement and then recomputes that whatever statistic you're trying to determine and then does it as many times as you wish. Um, and hopefully by doing that resampling technique, you get um, a sense, right, of that sort of empirical distribution kind of resembles the underlying distribution of the data, right? And, and that's how they estimate significance. Very quick, very easy to implement computationally. Um, it's kind of like the foundation of a lot of modern statistics courses that we teach. You know, my university focuses more on these resampling techniques. 
Okay, so how, how, would, how would you put that into practice? So same data set, right? Um, you know, what, what's nice is there's, I found an R package that does transfer entropy. You identify what, what variables you want to determine causality. You can also determine the leg, how many boot track samples. So it kind of gives you a little more stuff to um, sort of fine tune. And you get results like this kind of printed to the screen where it does estimate causality in both directions, which, which is kind of nice. Um, that, that TE stands for transfer entropy, right? That's sort of a measure of that divergence. Um, and then, then from the bootstrap samples, it gives you significance. Very nice. But well, once I got that done, one thing that I noticed Important, right? Because if you're talking about this and this bootstraps, you want to, you want more is better, right? It got slowed down really quick, right? It, you know, just running through an entire FlexNet data set that I worked with, um, it took a whole day to kind of run through those. So, but when I, when I had a 14 day leg built in, when I reduced that down to no leg, it was quick. So, I mean, you have to kind of take into consideration these computational pieces too, right? And the time it takes and, you know, how to, how to set that up so it's computationally efficient. So, so that, that's transfer entropy. So we have greater causality, transfer entropy. And, and then this, this last one, and I, I'm sort of fascinated by it. Um, it's called convergent cross mapping, um, pioneered by Dr. George Suihara, um, quantitative ecologist. Um, kind of an interesting career I was looking, looking a little bit into his background, right? He, ecologist left um, yeah, academia to go into the world of finance for many years and then came back. And, and I think it, I kind of see that different perspective um, brought into this. But what I like about it is it uses dynamical systems um, to think about causality. And, you know, hopefully I'm going to get a little bit messy, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to get too far into the weeds, but... Um, what I like about it is that when you think about time series of variables, and uh, what they are is that they're a projection of what's of this complex dimensional space called a manifold. What you see in the picture here is a Lorenz attractor, right? And I don't know why they always pick like a chaotic dynamical system <laughs> for these. I think it's because it's, because it's chaotic, right? And if you can make sense of it, then, then that's like a bonus in your book. But uh, you know, so you have these independent time series and they know that if you have a point on the manifold, right, that determines how the variables are associated. Now, what they do, right, they have that, the idea is you start with these time series and you want to reconstruct back that manifold, because once you know that manifold, then you can begin to investigate uh, causality. So they apply these legs of time series to construct what are called shadow manifolds. I think of these as just another projection of the manifold. Um, and then what you do is once you have these shadow manifolds, kind of this intermediate step, you can reconstruct the original one. Kind of, kind of interesting. Now, um, you know, this was a very brief overview. What I liked about, um, you know, this paper when I looked at it, it was published in 2012, I think in Nature. They provide lots of videos of how this work, kind of short insights. And so what I want to do is I kind of want to watch this brief video here about state space reconstruction, kind of like now that you have these shadow manifolds, how do you reconstruct and determine causality? So I'm going to play this here. Let me know if it doesn't work and I can go over to the other one. John, did you want us to hear the sound on that video? Is, is the sound not going? I'm sorry. No, I think you'd have to, in the sharing settings, you'd also oh. make, make sure you share your sound. Okay. Okay. Thank you for letting me know that. Um, 
I'm going to try this again here. <laughs> Let me pull it. I'll just pull up the whole video here separately. Is that is that working? Did you change your sharing settings? Okay. It, I think you may need to re reshare, stop sharing, and then it's possible. Okay. You know what? Th this is in the spirit of like you know over Zoom, right? I'm just gonna keep moving ahead because <laughs> if I if I get bogged down. But what I can do is I can share these links ahead of time, or um, you know, it's in the supplementary information for this article. They're worth taking a look at. So I'm perfectly fine. That that's one lesson I learned from this pandemic is just to keep kind of moving ahead, <laughs> right? So yeah. thank thank you for for letting me know that. Uh -huh. All right, so let me go back here. Okay, excellent. Um, good. So how, how you implement this, what, what's nice is that they um, provided a, an R package on the authors of Sugihara and his colleagues on how to do this. I think it's elegantly beautiful. Um, I like how it computes causality in both directions. Um, what they do um, is determine significance. Like, is this like a significant causality or just yeah, somewhat, um, they look at, um, determine how does it compare to just autocorrelation of time series, right? It's kind of similar to a Granger test. Um, how, how it works in R, one thing that, you know, just to kind of be aware, there's also additional parameters um, to sort of set here. Um, so, so you have to identify what's called the embedding dimension, the library size, um, and, and that's tricky, right? Um, but it, it's, you know, not, not impossible. Um, and then determining significance can be arbitrary. And sort of this output, right, that value that I have is like, what's the p-value of that significance? And so, I mean, it's it's zero, like it's zero, but like, it's just like zero with a lot of decimal places before I, I just didn't print out that number of decimals. So um, I, I like it, it gives you kind of a result. Okay, Let, let's kind of go back to this sample scenario. And what I'm going to do, like I said, just to remind you, is use this sample time series of daily air temperature, daily NAE from Niwot Ridge. What I'm going to do is ask, do the methods predict causality in the same way? All right. And I, here I kind of looked at air temperature and NAE, but I'm going to broaden that out a little bit more to look at sort of other um, variables, time series that come from the FlexNet 2015 data set. It's mainly GPP, TER. Um, air temperature, precipitation, and then PPFD, photosynthetic photon flux density. I, I pick those um, mainly just because when I work with students, right, who don't necessarily have a firm ground in biology, those are things that I can very quickly explain. They, they know what air temperature is. They know precipitation um, incoming, you know, PPFD, think of my, I'm like, okay, it's hard to explain VPD, you know, without the eyes glazing over a little bit, but that, um, right. Um, so here we go. So, so let's look at these methods sort of at now. I call this, you know, just for lack of a better word, a bubble plot, right? And um, so what you see, if there is a circle, that means between the cause variable and the effect, um, that is a prediction of significant causality. So for example, um, at Niwot Ridge, right, precipitation um, or GPP, excuse me, is caused by precipitation, right? That sort of, it, you know, there was a significant um, effect there. Um, and, you know, so the green causality is kind of in the red, transfer entropy is in the green, air temperature is in the, the blue. Okay, sorry, convergent cross mapping is in the blue. So, I mean, one thing that you should see is not all methods predict the same level of causality, right? They, they kind of differ. And I, I think that's due to the fact that like, you know, Granger causality is linear, right? Um, the other two methods are not, right? They don't necessarily assume linearity of processes. So, so that's one thing to kind of pay attention to. 
Now, I didn't just look at cause and effects between these, these variables. I also said, well, is there like, does precipitation cause air temperature, right? I know that sounds silly, right? And um, I get that, right? Because I mean, why would they be causally related, right? And, but, and all that I sort of read leading up to it, 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 they really stress the emphasis of like not excluding variables offhand, right? Being causally related. Now, how I would sort of describe that is, you know, maybe there's some sort of confounding variable, like seasonality that you can build in. And so you can make, you know, sort of these other, I should say, latent variables. I think that's the term I'm looking for. That would kind of account for some of that causality. Um, so if you look at sort of this bubble plot for all the other variables that I tested, right, between the causes and effects, you get um, the graph shown on the right, right? And, and, and notice one thing that I like, is it's not a symmetric along the diagonal, right? So just because like, for example, GPP is caused by precip, um, precip is not necessarily caused by um, GPP for, for all three of these methods. And, you know, and, and that's that bi-directional causality, like maybe is not a, a factor here. But, you know, th this was kind of interesting. Okay, no matter what method, are they kind of pulling, pulling the same sort of causes, um, causa predicting the same level of causality, no matter the method that I use? Now, one thing that I thought about is, okay, I, I have sort of these, these data here, right? Um, how does that compare by chance to load, right? So just looking at sort of the, the smaller data set, the one on the left to sort of that larger bubble plot on the right, right? If I say, okay, at least two of the methods, right? Um, it could be any combination, predict causality for a given pair of variables. That happened about 66% of the time. Um, and sort of the larger one is about 83%. Um, and then you could say, well, what do, you know, what is the, you know, percentage where all methods predict causality. So about, about half, right? 50% of the time. Now, when I thought about this, how does this work by chance alone, right? So, um, you know, for just a given pair of variables, right? For those three, it's it's a nice sort of combinatorics problem. And, you know, I'll admit, like it took me a little while yesterday to figure it out. I think, you know, it's just me, right? Getting my math brain on, but about 50%. Uh, of the time, you would expect that at least two methods predict causality. So even there, right, just what, what I've been able to pick up on this one site is that, you know, it does, they're more consistent than by chance alone. And, and the same for all methods predicting causality. That made me feel a little bit better, right, that, you know, I could have like gone a little bit deeper. But, you know, j just by these things alone, right? That, that seemed to suggest to me, okay, right? Um, these methods, you know, no matter which one I choose, you know, are, are picking up sort of, you know, the same level of causality. Now, separate that from the discussion of, does this make sense, right? And, and, and that's sort of that next level of interpretation that you can do. Okay. So, so now that we have this application to the, um, you know, just kind of a smaller site, let's broaden that out to different sites across the network. So, so what I did is I looked at the Fluxnet 2015 data set. I picked sites that have about five years worth of data, um, you know, in there and then kind of aggregated up to the daily scale um, and then just did some other filtering checks just, you know, just to kind of remove any sort of oddities. So I had about 69 total sites. And like I said, I looked at the variables of air temperature, precipitation, PPFD, GPP, TR, and NEE. And you, know, you can have the different land cover types um, that are represented in this data set. Now, again, lo looking at this map, definitely like you know, my data come from a lot in North America, Europe, right? So spatial representativeness, you know, we have to you know, take into consideration, but you know, just as a good first step, right? What, what gets predicted if we sort of apply these techniques more broadly? So this, this is kind of a tricky problem to do computationally, right? And, you know, here I, I kind of want to just acknowledge and sort of like emphasize kind of like just how far um, this idea of, you know, sort of iteration across, you know, several different sites and applying the same processes have advanced even in the past decade. 
right? Um, using R. And so I've really become sort of like, you know, enamored with this idea of taking sort of a large data set, splitting it up into smaller chunks. So here I kind of split it up into different sites um, and then applying the same thing, whether it's like a one causality test or the other, right? Looking at all possible accommodation to each of these sites. So it's just kind of adding a different column onto what's called this nested data frame and then combining them all back together to make a long and skinny data frame for visualization. Now, he, here's the reason kind of why I want to emphasize this is, you know, I, I'm a mathematician. Right? Um, I'm not a computer scientist. I, you know, I do use a lot of programming, right? But, you know, learning skills to kind of develop to become a more efficient programmer I mean, became a high priority for me because once I learned how to do some sort of call iteration without tears, right? Um, it was, I was able to kind of be more efficient and kind of, you know, explore more deeper connections into the science that I wanted to do. And I, I just kind of want to stress just how nice this code is, right? So, you know, I used to think about, oh my gosh, setting up a for loop and iterating through that used to kind of give me heart palpitations. And you know, and, and I teach this to my students, right? Is like, here's ways, tools that you can organize that be confident in results to kind of move ahead. And I mean, just 12 lines of code versus like, you know, a huge um, data set. Okay, so let's take a look at, at these results, kind of comparing these methods more broadly. Um, so I have Granger causality, transfer entropy and convergent cross mapping. And these are across all of the 69 sites. Um, and so what this proportion of sites represent is, you know, what, what's the proportion that predicted causality between a given pair of variables? This is kind of interesting, right? Because you can start to see differences between the methods. It seems that greater causality predicts, you know, these variables, precipitation, PPFD, air temperature, you know, influence the fluxes, right, for a good proportion of sites. Whereas like transfer entropy, convergent cross mapping is a little more picky. Um, you know, and I do want to say the caveat here is, you know, this this came after, you know, I just want, like, want to go back, take a look at this code. Do I have all of the parameters and pieces set, right? But I mean, I, I thought this was like kind of a relief to see that there are differences between them different proportions and like, how does it work out? Also kind of looking at these bigger matrices. So I think I call these waffle plots, right? They look like um, waffles to eat. You know, you can start to see sort of differences in the methods um, and how they predict causality um, across all different possible combinations. I think what you're seeing like with Granger causality really shows sort of that limitation of linearity in the processes. Whereas for convergent cross mapping, trans for entropy, they're able to sort of be more discriminating in terms of is there causality or not, right? And, you know, one thing that sort of the next layer of analysis would be, would be to say, okay, do, do these make sense, right? Um, do they make sense ecologically? What do they mean? How would we interpret them? But kind of as a good first step, I'm like, okay, you know, and I'll, I'll talk, you know, in a little bit about which one would I choose, right? Um, you know, if I were to sort of hedge my bets on a method here. Also, you can split this up into looking at just different land cover types too, right? And that, that was kind of that next layer of processes. So how does it predict, you know, causality between the three methods um, for, for separated by land cover? Now, um, what I did, I, I just kind of plotted that sort of like, you know, no, three environmental variables to the three flux variables. You're not looking at proportion of sites because, you know, they just, there's some, some land cover types who are not really well represented. That's kind of along the bottom of, of this chart here. I mean, evergreen needle leaf forests are, you know, overrepresented compared to savannas, right? So don't, you know, one caveat is don't read too much into like, why do some of these, like they're all colored purple, whereas others have more distinctions between them. But again, like this is where we can start to think about, you know, in terms of this time series causality, like, you know, does precip cause or is GPP caused by precip, right? That, that seems to be a lot of the sites, um, but there's more sites where GPP is caused by air temperature. 
you know, for these evergreen needle leaf bores. Do, does that seem to make sense with our understanding of these different processes and how we would expect sort of the biophysical principles um, that we build into our models to work together? So again, that, that would be sort of like, you know, sort of the next layer to look at on this. So kind of in terms of like next steps, like where, where do we go from here? What, what would we do next? So I guess a question is like, you know, and I kind of pose this to you and you can sort of put comments or questions in the chat, like would a deeper synthesis applying these techniques be useful, right? And, and I mean, with the caveat that, you know, we would have to like, you know, delve into the methods a little bit more, kind of fine tune them, but you know, what, what could we gain from applying these techniques to, you know, the, the FlexNet 2015 data set writ large. I mean, and so, I mean, type, type your comments, questions here, right? I have a couple more to wrap up, but I just wanted to pause and pose this question to the group too. We're all here, probably just digesting it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I know. And I mean, I can move on, right? I mean, we can have more time. No, it's, it's nice to have a time for a question. I just didn't want you to think it was that, you know, you were talking and no one could hear you or something. Oh, no, no, no. Like, trust me, I got over that very quickly teaching online last year, right? <laughs> and so I'm used to teaching in the Zoom era. So, yeah. Um, well, I guess uh, given the pros and cons of these methods, I think, are these the three that we should be kind of focusing on? Or is there something else that we haven't even thought about that's even more powerful? Or does it just get too complicated that you know, working with the ones here are, are helpful and good enough? Yeah, there, there is one more, right? And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead pretty quickly here. Um, it's called the PC algorithm by Peter Sprites, Clark Glenn. Oh, oh, sorry, went type too fast here, um, where they use graph theory to determine causality. Um, and graph theory is just a little too far outside of my wheelhouse that I was like confident to sort of share everything here with you. But, you know, what they think about is time series are like nodes on a graph. And what it does is it first considers all the different possible combinations. And then it sequentially tests these different nodes to determine, you know, using like, nearest neighbor algorithm, clustering algorithms to see if they're independent from each other. So you start with the graph on the left and then you end up at the end of the day with the graph on the right. Kind of interesting, right? Like, like I said, if I you know, knew a little bit more graph theory to be dangerous, I, I would have presented on that, but I think that has some merit too. So it seemed to be a very quick algorithm and you know, interesting to look at. The downfall was that you know, you can have alternative graph structures that sort of predict the same kind of level of causality. So one way to think about it is if you have like three nodes and like A, um, you know, causes B and B causes C, you know, that from a certain mathematical perspective, that's the same as A causing C. So it, you know, with more combinations of variables that all these alternative structures could grow pretty quickly too. So, uh, okay. Oh, um, well, well, let, let's talk about maybe what I would think about potential follow on steps. So one is we could look at different times of the year during the year. So like separate growing season, not growing season, right? That, that in increase ups the processing time, but it's not insurmountable. Um, do a closer comparison of results across these different land cover types. Uh, one thing that would be sort of interesting kind of, you know, bringing in the modeling, like if there's sort of a simple process-based model that we could apply at each of these different FlexNet sites and then sort of back engineer causality to, to sort of test things out. I, I, I think that would be a good follow-on study too. Um, that, that paper by own body kind of, you know, reference that, you know, that, that was one, one aspect of it. Um, how would I use these tools too? Kind of just wrapping up. Well, you know, one, one way could be sort of a pre-model analysis. So, you know, you, you're given a task of modeling something and you have all these different input variables um, and you're trying to predict this process Z, whatever it is. 
right? So you could do causality tests to maybe kind of eliminate ones that you don't think that are causing your output and then just focus on what's there. What I like about it is that approach, it prevents sort of this endless modeling cycle. Like, oh yeah, maybe we got to include that. Oh, we got to include that. So it kind of narrows down, um, you know, what you can focus on. But it might also remove some important processes, right? And that's kind of the fun and the joy of modeling. It's sort of like seeing, oh yeah, there's linkages kind of, you know, between one variable, right? That I didn't think was be linked to my output, you know, but it's kind of linked in sort of a very different way. You could also do a post-model analysis, right? So you have your process model, right? And then you apply these dynamic, empirical dynamic models, look at model sensitivity, parameter sensitivity. Um, but here's the thing, and this is one thing that I'm always like cognizant of when modeling, right? Is that if you have poor model outputs, right? You could, you know, apply these tests and say, oh yeah, it's because there's not a lack of causality. So I guess, you know, that that's why I ended up my got the result that I did versus maybe it was just, you know, there's a step in the modeling that I didn't consider. So, you know, it, it's not the end all of everything. Um, but, but I think, you know, using these as sort of a pre-model or post-model analysis, you know, does bear some fruit. Okay, what, what method would I rec recommend? So, you know, I, I kind of judge this on three criteria. Codability, can I code it without too many tiers? Um, is it sort of like translatable? Right? Does it consider nonlinear processes, linear ones? Understandable, is it a black box, right? That dreaded black box of modeling. And can it help me do the modeling job better? Notably, I mean, there, there's like my evaluation, it, it does um, go across the board, right? I think Granger causality is very quickly to implement, right? It's not a black box um, because it's not that many lines of code. But I mean, I just don't know how much information you can get from highly nonlinear processes compared to the other two. Um, transfer entropy just kind of seemed more like a black box to me, maybe just because I, you know, with convergent cross mapping, I knew some of the dynamical systems theory, but Again, but it's a mix. This you should add these to your toolkits and then apply them judiciously too. All right. So one thing, and I should probably put this in the. I'll put this in the link over questions. Um, all the code and scripts that I use to generate these plots and the analysis um, are going to be on my GitHub page. Um, so you can download them. I kind of believe in the open sharing of science. Right. Use them. Modify them. Tell me where I'm wrong. Right. That's perfectly fine. Um, I, I welcome that conversation. And kind of before questions, just the shameless plug, um, we're hiring, right? So I'd love to have some of you on this call if you're interested to be my colleague. We're gonna be launching ads for two positions. One um, in statistics and data science, tenure track, um, and also in computer science, which, you know, depending on sort of, you know, your experience could be tenure track or non-tenure track. And these would be sort of a thick term non-tenure track. Our ads aren't posted yet, um, but if you want to join my team, um, just know and I can send you a link when the ads are posted. And, and there's my Twitter and email. So, so with that, I'm going to um, pause and just say thank you and take some time for, for questions. And... Well, thank, thanks a million. That was very, very illuminating, uh, especially using these case studies of flux data that we all know so well and be able to see the comparisons. I think mean, people like me are interested in these methods. We've used them, but kind of a little confused about who better and what they do differently. And uh, I think you did a great job uh, helping us here. So um, please, uh, people ask questions, uh, either uh, raise your hand or uh, there's a pause. Please just ask the question. Uh, okay, I see some coming up in the in the chat here. Um, so yes, um, you know, in terms of the gap filling of data, I think if I remember right, I kind of removed, um, you know, I just kind of wrote them as NA if there was like large days worth of gap filled data. So I kind of applied sort of the quality context. And so, you know, if if there was something that just was a long stretch of blanks in a time series, then I just removed that site. So that, that's kind of why it went from like all these FluxNet sites down to 69. Um, and, you know, we, we would have to think about, 
you know, this gap filling question, right? Um, that, that would be sort of another layer to kind of process and consider. Um, what, what's the least length of the time series data and making these methods robust? Um, got, you know, they, they consider just sort of immediate legs, like, you know, one to like at the same time. Um, so, you know, it, it's flexible there. That, that's one thing that I appreciate in all the methods. Like you could specify no legs and just look at causality. But I, I think from a, you know, environmental science perspective, we do know that like, you know, there are like environmental variables that take some time before you see them reflected in the fluxes. So this, you know, these data are well situated to kind of apply this method. Uh, Gil Borer has a question. Gil? So it's something I'm contemplating with since I started looking at sieve data sets. So we, we all know there's difference between summer and winter, difference between day and night is the causality methods have a specific feature that makes them robust or they're going to fall in the same hole and basically find that everything that varies with the daily yeah. seasonal cycle is causally driven by the same thing. Yeah, I mean that, you know, this day night difference, I mean, how I might approach it is maybe just make a separate time series for nighttime data, a separate time series for daytime data, test them out, see what's different. Uh, also like one of the papers that I saw introduced seasonality as another variable, right? And so it was just kind of a, you know, they just sort of interpolated a sine curve and that was used to sort of tease out some of these sort of like confounding like precipitation and air temperature. Um, but, but yeah, that, that would be a good thing to sort of consider. Um, that, how do you deal with partial causality? The X grander causes Y keep an X one constant. So I think, um, you know, that that's kind of been addressed in the literature where, you know, just that additional, like it's sort of like a conditional probability distribution X, um, is conditional on Y and Z, right? And I think, you know, that's not, you just kind of include that conditional probability when you compute these significance um, in terms of these causality tests. So. Uh, oh, good. Um, there's, can, can this method be applied at COVID-19 data? Probably. Right, I mean that that's like sometimes these COVID nineteen models they they come from all over, right? Which, but I, but I think so, um, you know that and and that's you know that's probably a key key thing to look at, right? I, I'm not that well versed in all these COVID nineteen models, but why not? So. Yeah, so, okay, it's a major causality based on autoregressive models, one needs to use continuous time series, yep. Um, you know, um, I think so, right? And, and I just think you would have to sort of like increase that level of the lag in there. But um, in terms of like from one year to the next, yeah, um, I don't know, right? And, and that, that would be a good follow up question. I had a private message for a question. Um, so does the ability to interpret the model, the causality in the context of the data from an environmental perspective influence the choice of method or the choice of which method to use or present? Um, great question. Um, I, I think, you know, when, when we're looking at these, if, if you know that your processes are more linear than not, right? I, I would say go with Granger um, causality. But, you know, just in my heart of hearts, knowing the FlexNet data, right? These are highly nonlinear processes that we're employing here. So uh, I, I just think using nonlinear methods from the start would be just the way to go. Uh, John, at the beginning, you talked a little bit about association versus causation. And I often hear in the medical literature, they're often talking about associations. Could you maybe clarify that a little bit more, maybe to help us understand? Sure. Sure. 
I mean, I, I think of association between two variables is that you can write down the definite functional relationship between these two, right? Which it could be linear, could be nonlinear. Um, so actually I'll go back to that slide because I might have gone through that too, like quick, I was nervous, right? That's, this is such an august group. Um, okay, so like association, you know, there, there is this sort of quadratic relationship. And the, and the second one, right, your variance of y increases with x. So it's kind of another sort of, you know, additional level with it, right? But, you know, they're not associated when there's kind of just this not constant relationship um, or um, between the two variables, right? But, I mean, I, I just love this subtitle correlation implies association but not causation right so um and it's correlation implies association because there's some linear relationship between them um but causation is you know just you know a much you know much more technical term than just association so uh, yeah Okay, let me stop another question. What is the difference between influence X influences Y and X causes Y? Um, okay, so I think this is where I also need to be more robust in my language, right? So I, I might have used influence and causality synonymously, right? But I should say, you know, causality means that, you know, there, this variable X, um, is directly linked to the outputs that you see in Y, right? And I mean, that to me, that sounds like an influence, but I think, you know, if we were sort of more robust, um, influence could happen through some sort of like latent um, association too. Uh, Th those of us in the methane world have a very unique problem. During the day, sun goes up, temperature gets warm, it causes more transpiration, and therefore there can be more xylem transport of methane. And so therefore the methane flux may scale with transpiration, but then there's also a more photosynthesis that might cause more uh, ex exudates in the roots that might prime the microbes. How do we tease out those two causal factors that are kind of correlated in time essentially, but have completely different mechanisms. This is really kind of a, a yeah. tough one we're trying to deal with. I mean, here, here's my off the top of the head response is this is where modeling can come into play, right? Where you can write down different models that may sort of like make this causality implicit, mm -hmm. right? Or, or not, and just sort of say, okay, does the outputs from the, this model, right? And then kind of reverse engineer a causality from there. Yeah. So, I mean, applying these tests that, and then you have some different alternative structures to, to imply. So, Trisha, I think I saw your hand up too. So uh, feel okay, free to- Okay, Sean, I, uh, I thank you for the, uh, yeah, thank you for, the, for, for your talk, for your, I, I meet you expert, I'll ask you another question here. <laughs> okay. So, uh, a, you know, uh, from the data to data or from method to method, that's uh, maybe uh, less some confidence. And uh, so for the model, if we have some formulas, so there's some parameters, variables, y and x. So what's your, the comments or favorite is a parametric model and a non-parametric model, which one would be better? I mean, I like non-parametric models and tests, right? And, and that's why I like the, the transfer entropy, the convergent cross mapping, they're non-parametric tests, whereas Granger causality is. Um, so, I mean, by, you know, kind of looping back to the, my previous comment, right, by forcing a model that you're kind of parameterizing it, right, you're doing sort of a, any causality test to imply kind of have this influence of being, you know, parametric in that regards. But I, I, I like non-parametric tests because it sort of frees you from that 
bias of parameters that may interpret things. Thank you very much. Well, I assume we're running on to our hour and I guess people need to kind of move on. So we wanna thank you very, very much. And I think the proof to the pudding is all the papers that will explode from <laughs> literature in the next few months uh, based on some of these techniques. Uh, uh, I know we were very interested in applying some of these ourselves for our, our Delta work. In fact, we just got funded on a grant to kind of think about this. So I really thank you very, very much. And uh, I think everyone just kind of clap. No, thank you, thank you. Uh, very, very eloquent, very clear, and uh, really appreciate it. So, right. any last comments from anybody or uh, myself? So, see everybody's faces. <laughs>